Hi, and welcome to this screencast about the Go programming language. This will be a high-level overview, so I'm going to leave some things out for the sake of time, but if you've ever done any programming in Java, C Sharp, Python, or another modern language, then you shouldn't have much of a problem keeping up. So let's dive right in with a code example. In my opinion, this is closest to Java maybe, but that's only cosmetic. The first line declares that the code in this file lives in a package main. Every Go application will start off by executing the code in the main package. Next, on lines 3 through 6, we have an import statement which will bring in two outside packages that we want to use in our application. After the imports comes the logic for our application. You can probably guess what it is going to do. We'll do something a little more interesting but still simple in the next application. When a Go program starts, it looks inside of the main package and it will expect to see a function called main. This is the entry point of the application. Functions are declared using the func keyword, followed by the name of the function, followed by the parameters in parentheses, and then optionally by the return types. Yes, I said types. The body of the function is inside of curly braces. If the function has no return type or types, then they are omitted. There is no void. Inside of the main function on line 17, there's a variable declaration. There are a few ways to declare variables in Go. In this case, we're using type inference. If the variable is declared inside of a function and the colon equals assignment operator is used to initialize it, then the type of the variable will be inferred from the right-hand side. As an aside, you can also declare a variable without initializing it. In this case, you would use the var keyword, followed by the name of the variable, followed by its type. This is the reverse of how it is often done in other languages such as Java and C Sharp. Also, notice that there is no semicolon at the end of the statement on line 17. Go does not require them. The variable t on line 17 has type slice. We'll see why in just a minute. Slices are basically references to arrays. You don't see arrays too much in Go. Instead you see slices as they are more flexible. Slices have a length which can be accessed using the built-in len function as seen in the for loop on line 19. Notice several other things about the for loop. First is a lack of parentheses. Second, the variable i is again using type inference with the colon equals assignment operator. Also, the body of the for loop must be enclosed in curly braces even if it is only one line. Finally, on line 20, we are calling the print ln function in the fmt package and giving an index in the slice to display. As you can see, you index a slice the same way as you would an array. But how does the list of squares get created? The create squares function on line 8 handles that. There is one parameter, bound, which is an integer. Notice that just like variable declarations, the name precedes the type. Also, n notice the return type follows the parameter list. This is the notation for a type that is a slice of ints. Also, you could have multiple return types, and if so, those would be separated by commas and in parentheses as well. Again, if there is no return type, just omit it, as there is no void. So the first thing we need to do is create a slice of ints to return. Line 9 takes care of this. Because the variable squares is being initialized with the colon equals operator, the make function will actually create the slice for us. The first parameter to make is the type we want to create, and the second is the length. There is also an optional third parameter, which is the capacity, but if it is omitted, the capacity is the same as the length. On line 10, we have a for loop like before, except this time, the for loop uses the cap function to get the capacity of the slice to use as the upper bound. Line 11 assigns a value to an index in the slice similar to how arrays would work. The right hand side warrants some discussion. Obviously, the math.pow function raises the first parameter to the power of the second. Pow accepts two float 64s and returns one of the same. This is why you see so many typecasts. Casting the first parameter to float 64 is necessary because we used type inference with the counter variable i in the for loop and the type was inferred to be int. 
We don't have to cache the second parameter because we're passing a literal value that can be automatically converted to a float64. Finally, because pow returns a float64, we must cache the return value to an int because our slice is declared to be of type int in line 9. The last line of the function returns the slice with the squares in it. Now to execute this code, there are two choices. Go is a compiled language, but the compilation is so fast you can do the compilation and then immediately run it. So let's open a command prompt, and I already have the Go SDK installed and added the Go tools to my path. So if we run the command Go, we will see that we have a Git or Rails style command line app. You send commands to the Go program, and the two that we are interested in are build and run. Build will compile the Go source and then place the result in a file. Since I'm on Windows, it created the .exe file, but on other platforms it would create an appropriate executable format. So it will take another step to explicitly run it. Run will compile the Go source into a temporary file and then run that. This was intended to be an introduction to the Go language so that we can get into more interesting things faster. In the next video, we'll look at how to use types in Go and build something more practical.